In this video, we're going to discuss some domain issues that might come up when you're working with inverses. So back in our definition, we had this idea that you had to meet these requirements in order for two functions to be inverses. But then there was this kind of vague statement that all x in the domain of g and for all x in the domain of f. And it, that is fairly vague. So let's look at an example of where domain issues might come up. And so we're going to start off with, we're going to find the inverse of f of x equals the square root of x. Now the question is, does it have an inverse? And it does. If I were to sketch really quickly over here, the square root of x, and I look at it, it passes the horizontal line test, so it has an inverse because it is 1 to 1. Right, now that we know it has an inverse, let's find the inverse. So f of x equals the square root of x. I'll go through this quickly. We replace f of x with y. So y equals the square root of x. We interchange x and y. So x equals the square root of y. And then we square both sides and we get x squared equals y, and then we replace y with f inverse. So f inverse of x equals x squared. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, wait a second. We just looked at whether x squared has an inverse, and the answer is no. And one thing is, is if the original function has an inverse, then the inverse function also has to have an inverse. And, you know, so f inverse of x equals x squared does not have an inverse. And that makes sense because if I were to sketch it, it doesn't pass the horizontal line test. So if a function has an inverse, then the inverse also has to have an inverse. That's kind of the way this works. So there's definitely something going wrong here, and it has to do with the domain. Now, if we were to compare these two graphs, remember that when you graph the inverse, it's a reflection over the line y equals x. And so if I were to put in, so this is x squared, and I were to graph in the square root of x, notice that x squared is not the graph of the square root of x reflected over the line y equals x. We have this extra part here. And so this is where the domain um, issue comes up, where sometimes you start off with a graph that does have an inverse, and then when you get there, get to the actual inverse, we have a little bit too much in there. So what we do is, when we have this situation and we need only part of it, we're going to restrict the domain. And so basically we want to get rid of that part here. So what we did here was actually correct. But we ended up not, we left out one little part. And that is, in order for this part to look like this part reflected, we're going to have to restrict a domain for 0 and greater. So the actual answer should be, if f of x equals the square root of x, then f inverse of x equals x squared, where x has to be greater than or equal to 0. So then, if we were to sketch these, here's the square root of x, and then here is x squared, where x is greater than or equal to 0. And now we can see that, oh yes, these are inverses of each other. The graphs look like, you know, they're symmetry, they're reflected over the line y equals x, so this works. And so while this doesn't come up all the time, it does come up where 
you have a function that has an inverse, and then when you get the inverse, it's not an in, it doesn't have an inverse itself. So then you gotta restrict the domain. Okay, then comes the next part. What if we have a function that doesn't have an inverse, but we want to have an inverse? So let's look at an example of that. Restrict the domain of f of x equals x minus 1 squared, so it has an inverse. Find the inverse. All right, so let's look at what this graph of f of x equals x minus 1 squared. So we go back to our parent functions. Um, the parent function is x squared. We're subtracting 1 inside the function, so that means we're moving it right one unit. So it looks something like this. So here's our function. f of x equals x minus 1 squared. So, just to be clear, does f of x have an inverse? The answer is no. It does not have an inverse. Okay, so this comes up often in math. We have these functions that don't have inverses, but we want an inverse for the function. So what do we do? Because having an inverse for functions is extremely important. Um, and it helps us a lot in mathematics. You've actually used these kind of ideas before. You probably just didn't know it. So the question actually told us what to do. If we have a function that doesn't have an inverse, but we want an inverse, we restrict the domain. We say, all right, well, we're only going to take part of the function. So there are two ways to restrict the domain for this problem. Two ways to restrict the domain. Okay, so one would be f of x equals x minus 1 squared, where x is greater than or equal to 1. And the other one would be f of x equals x minus 1 squared, where x is less than or equal to 1. So this is 1 right here. And so all we do is we say, okay, well, either we're going to take this half of it or we're going to take this half of it. And if we only take half of it, like if we take that half, then, oh, now we have a graph that is one-to-one. -one. We have a function that is one-to-one, -one, and we can take the inverse of that. Or over here, we now have a graph that is one-to-one, -one, and we can take the inverse of that. Right, so let's go ahead and go through the process of finding the inverse. And so we would have f of x equals x minus 1 squared. We replace f of x with y. So we have y equals x minus 1 squared. We then interchange x and y. x is y minus 1 squared. We then solve for y. So we'll take the square root of both sides. Now this is kind of a tricky part. When I take the square root of this, we just get y minus 1. When I take the square root of x, we actually get plus or minus the square root of x. And then we solve for y, and so y ends up being plus or minus the square root of x plus 1. So which one do we use? Do we use the plus version? or the minus version. And which one we use depends on which of these restrictions we actually uh, put into place. So let's look at the example. So there's two ways we could have done this. A, we could have had f of x equals x minus 1 squared, where x is greater than or equal to 1. So if I were to sketch a graph of that, so let's see here. 
So it is the right half. So this is f of x. So then the one of these that's going to look like a reflection would be, we go up one, it's got to be that f inverse of x. So the inverse in this case would be the positive square root of x plus 1. Now version b of this would have been if we said f of x is x minus 1 squared, where x is less than or equal to 1. So if we were to sketch that, so there's 1. It's going to look kind of like that. So there's f of x. So then the inverse would be a reflection of that. So f inverse of x. And so our inverse would be the f inverse of x equals um, a negative square root of x plus 1. And that's what this graph here is. All right. Um, now, while both of these are correct, and for this section of the uh, book, I would take both of those, or on a test, I would take both of those, we do tend to go with the positive side of things. So if there was one that most people would go with, it's probably this one. Um, you tend to not look at the negative, more negative version of things. It's easier to work with the more positive version of things. But they're both, you know, we restricted the domain on both of them. We got the graphs, we got the inverse. And so they are both correct when it comes to restricting domains. All right, so in this video, we looked at the domain issue. And the domain issue does come up um, a good amount when we look at inverses of functions. Because a lot of functions just don't have an inverse. So when we have a function that doesn't have an inverse and we want an inverse, then we have to restrict the domain. And so here's an example of how we restrict the domain so that we do have an inverse.